Hi everyone. In this video, I want to talk about a process that we can use uh, in order to inform a selection of rolling element bearings for a particular application. So in this process, we're going to make use of two tables uh, from the Duvinal textbook. And table 14.1 uh, is a table that gives some example bearing specifications for a given set of bearings. Now, of course, these are just more, I would consider them example tables. Um, if we were looking at, at you know, making an actual selection, we'd probably use a, a supplier catalog um, for a particular bearing supplier. Uh, table 14.2 gives uh, example rated load capacities for bearings. And these are at a life of uh, nine times 10 to the seventh cycles and assuming 90% reliability. So it's kind of important to keep those things in mind um, as we make use of these example tables that the textbook provides. So the, the important thing to consider when it comes to uh, using these tables and making the selection, I mentioned that table 14.2 assumes a desired life of nine times 10 to the seventh, or I think as the book lists it, uh, 90 times 10 to the sixth. So this table, 14.2, assumes a bearing life of 90 times 10 to the sixth cycles, which is also nine times 10 to the seventh. And you'll probably see me write it that way. And it assumes ninety percent reliability. However, that's just one particular life rating that we could potentially use in our design. So we might need to adjust that to, to account for what we actually want um, for our, our rated life. So two equations that we're gonna make use of to do this are one, an equation that looks like that, or equivalently, I can rearrange this equation and present it a different way. As this. Now in these two equations, the variable C is the rated load capacity while C required, C sub required is the required load capacity. Oops. F sub R is the radial load for the application of the bearing. And L is the life at the load F sub R. And L sub R, I've already mentioned, is 9 times 10 to the 7th specifically when we're talking about using table 14.2. Now of course if we're using 
uh, a different source of data, a different catalog, different table, uh, that L sub R could be different. So this is something to keep in mind that this is just for uh, this particular uh, table that we're talking about. I also said that this assumption for the two equations and, and for that table is for 90% reliability. And we can make an adjustment to that. We can adjust our, our reliability by modifying these equations with a reliability factor k sub r. And I end up with something like that, where I've factored in this case of R value, um, which is again a, a reliability factor. We can read this reliability factor from the textbook. So that's one correction we could make. Uh, we could also make a correction for shock loading. So if we, we expect there to be a a suddenly applied load to the bearing, we might need to make a correction for that, uh, in which case we can introduce uh, an application factor. So this application factor would be multiplied by F sub R for any shock that we, we might see. And that again comes from a, um, a, a table that we can read from the textbook. So these, uh, these equations are also making assumption about the type of loading uh, that, we would, uh, that we would be carrying. And in them, you only see this radial load that we've described. Now the problem is that many times bearings are expected to also carry some thrust load uh, when, we, when we would uh, submit them to a particular application. So we can make some adjustment to account for thrust loading. I'm going to call the thrust load F sub T. And to do that, we can introduce what we call an equivalent load and substitute it uh, for F sub R. So the same equations can then be used, but now using an equivalent load. And the equations vary uh, depending on what type of bearing we're talking about, but I'm just going to show the equations for radial ball bearings. The textbook provides equations for other types of bearings. So if we look at the ratio of the thrust load to the radial load, we can make some corrections. So if it's less than, uh, if that ratio is less than 0.35, then we don't really need to make any correction. We can just say that the equivalent is equal to the radial load. It's not enough of an impact for that to matter. From 0 0.35 to 10, we make a correction by the following equation. And finally, 
if f sub t over fr is greater than 10, so we have high thrust loads, then we use the equation 1.176 times f sub t for the equivalent load. And just to be complete, then, this of course results in our equations now being of the form kr, l sub r, c over feka, 3.33, as well as So these two equations now have been corrected a couple times. Uh, I've taken into account this reliability factor, Kr, this application factor, Ka, uh, as well as this equivalent load, which allows us to account for thrust, uh, thrust loading. So this set of equations would be the key ones uh, which kind of account for all of these things. We can then use these uh, in order to calculate a, a expected life under a given loading for a given bearing, uh, and that's this first equation. The second equation uh, allows us to take a, uh, an expected life and come up with a load requirement that, that would accomplish that. So kind of two different ways to look at the same problem. Uh, another useful thing uh, provided by the book is Table 14.4 gives some guidance as to uh, what the appropriate life specification for a bearing should be under di given different given conditions. So depending on how precise things need to be, um, how long we expect it to last, how much service uh, time it's expected to have, how much what that design life should be. So anywhere from you know 100 hours of design life up to 200,000 hours of design life as examples, which we could then convert to um, a number of cycles based on how fast. Uh, how fast the thing is spinning. So I'll go ahead and, and stop there. Thanks.